At another time Aladdin would have been frightened at the sight of so extraordinary a figure, but the danger he was in made him answer without hesitation, "'Whoever thou art, deliver me from this place.' He had no sooner spoken these words than he found himself on the very spot where the magician had last left him, and no sign of cave or opening, nor disturbance of the earth. Returning God's thanks to find himself once more in the world, he made the best of his way home. When he got within his mother's door, the joy to see her and his weakness for want of subsistence made him so faint that he remained for a long time as dead. As soon as he recovered, he related to his mother all that had happened to him, and they were both very vehement in their complaints of the cruel magician. Aladdin slept very soundly till late the next morning, when the first thing he said to his mother was that he wanted something to eat, and which she would give him his breakfast. "'Alas, child,' said she, "'I have not a bit of bread to give you. You ate up all the provisions I had in the house yesterday.' but I have a little cotton which I have spun. I will go and sell it, and buy bread and something for our dinner. Mother, replied Aladdin, keep your cotton for another time, and give me the lamp I brought home with me yesterday. I will go and sell it, and the money I shall get for it will serve both for breakfast and dinner, and perhaps supper too. Aladdin's mother took the lamp and said to her son, Here it is, but it is very dirty. If it were a little cleaner, I believe it would bring something more. She took some fine sand and water to clean it, but had no sooner began to rub it than in an instant a hideous genie of gigantic size appeared before her, and said to her in a voice of thunder, What wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave, and the slave of all those who have the lamp in their hands. I and the other slaves of the lump. Aladdin's mother, terrified at the sight of the genie, fainted, when Aladdin, who had seen such a phantom in the cavern, snatched the lamp out of his mother's hand and said to the genie boldly, I'm hungry, bring me something to eat. The genie disappeared immediately and in an instant returned with a large silver tray holding twelve covered dishes of the same metal, which contained the most delicious viands, six large white bread cakes on two plates, two flagons of wine, and two silver cups. All these he placed upon a carpet and disappeared. This was done before Aladdin's mother recovered from her swoon. Aladdin had fetched some water and sprinkled in her face to recover her. Whether that or the smell of the meat affected her cure, it was not long before she came to herself. "'Mother,' said Aladdin, "'be not afraid. Get up and eat. Here is what will put you in a heart, and at the same time satisfy my extreme hunger.' His mother was much surprised to see the great tray, twelve dishes, six loaves, the two flagons and cups, and to smell the savory odor which exhaled from the dishes. "'Child,' said she, "'to whom are we obliged for this great plenty and liberality? Has the Sultan been made acquainted with our poverty and had compassion on us?' "'It is no matter, mother,' said Aladdin. "'Let us sit down and eat, for you have almost as much need of a good breakfast as myself. When we have done, I will tell you.' Accordingly, both mother and son sat down and ate with a better relish, as the table was so well furnished." But all the time Aladdin's mother could not forbear looking at and admiring the tray and dishes, though she could not judge whether they were silver or any other metal, and the novelty more than the value attracted her attention. The mother and son sat at breakfast till it was dinner-time, and then they thought it would be best to put the two meals together. Yet after this they found they should have enough left for supper, and two meals for the next day. When Aladdin's mother had taken away and set by what was left, she went and sat down by her son on the sofa, saying, "'I expect to know that you should satisfy my impatience and tell me exactly what passed between the genie and you while I was in a swoon,' which he readily complied with. She was in as great amazement at what her son told her as at the appearance of the genie, and said to him, "'But son, what have we to do with genies?' I never heard that any of my acquaintance had ever seen one. 
How came that vile genie to address himself to me, and not to you, to whom he had peered before in the cave? Mother, answered Aladdin, the genie you saw is not the one who appeared to me. If you remember, he that I first saw called himself the slave of the ring on my finger, and this you saw called himself the slave of the lamp you had in your hand. But I believe you did not hear him, for I think you fainted as soon as he began to speak. What? cried the mother. Was your lamp then the occasion of this cursed genie's addressing himself rather to me than to you? Oh, my son, take it out of my sight, and put it where you please. I had rather you would sell it than run the hazard of being frightened to death again by touching it. And if you would take my advice, you would part also with the ring, and not have anything to do with genies, who, as our prophet has told us, are only devils. With your leave, mother, replied Aladdin, I shall now take care how I sell a lamp which may be so serviceable both to you and me. That false and wicked magician would not have undertaken so long a journey to secure this wonderful lamp if he had not known its value to exceed that of gold and silver. And, since we have honestly come by it, let us make a profitable use of it, without making any great show and exciting the envy and jealousy of our neighbours. However, since the genie frightened you so much, I will take it out of your sight, and put it where I may find it when I want it. The ring I cannot resolve to part with, for without that you had never seen me again, and though I am alive now, perhaps, if it were gone, I might not be so some moments hence. Therefore I hope you will give me leave to keep it, and wear it always on my finger. Aladdin's mother replied that he might do what he pleased. For her part, she would have nothing to do with genies, and never say anything more about them. By the next night they had eaten all the provisions the genie had brought, and the next day Aladdin, who could not bear the thoughts of hunger, putting one of the silver dishes under his vest, went out early to sell it, and addressing himself to a Jew whom he met in the streets, took him aside, and pulling out the plate, asked him if he would buy it. The cunning Jew took the dish, examined it, and as soon as he found that it was good silver, asked Aladdin at how much he valued it. Aladdin, who had never been used to such traffic, told him he would trust to his judgment and honor. The Jew was somewhat confounded at this plain dealing, and doubting whether Aladdin understood the material or the full value of what he offered to sell, took a piece of gold out of his purse and gave it to him, though it was but the sixtieth part of the worth of the plate. Aladdin, taking the money very eagerly, retired with so much haste that the Jew, not content with the exorbency of his profit, was vexed he had not penetrated into his ignorance, and was going to run after him to endeavor to get some change out of the piece of gold. But he ran so fast, and had got so far, that it would have been impossible for him to overtake him. Before Aladdin went home, he called at the baker's, brought some cakes of bread, changed his money, and, on his return, gave the rest to his mother, who went and purchased provisions enough to last them some time. After this manner they lived, till Aladdin had sold the twelve dishes singly, as necessity pressed, to the Jew, for the same money, who, after the first time, durst not offer him less, for fear of losing so good a bargain. When he had sold the last dish, he had recourse to the tray, which weighed ten times as much as the dishes, and would have carried it to his old purchaser, but that it was too large and cumbersome. Therefore he was obliged to bring him home with him to his mother's, where, after the Jew had examined the weight of the tray, he laid down ten pieces of gold, with which Aladdin was very well satisfied. When all of the money was spent, Aladdin had recourse again to the lamp. He took it in his hands, looked for the part where his mother had rubbed it with the sand, and rubbed it also, when the genie immediately appeared, and said, "'What wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave, and the slave of all those who have that lamp in their hands, I and the other slaves of the lamp.' "'I am hungry,' said Aladdin. "'Bring me something to eat.' The genie disappeared, and presently returned with a tray, the same number of covered dishes as before, set them down, and vanished. As soon as Aladdin found that their provisions were again expended, 
He took one of the dishes and went to look for his Jew chapman. But, passing by a goldsmith's shop, the goldsmith, perceiving him, called to him, and said, "'My lad, I imagine that you have something to sell to the Jew, whom I often see you visit. But perhaps you do not know that he is the greatest rogue even among the Jews. I will give you the full worth of what you have to sell, or I will direct you to other merchants who will not cheat you.' This offer induced Aladdin to pull his plate from under his vest and show it to the goldsmith, who at first sight saw that it was made of the finest silver, and asked him if he had sold such as this to the Jew. When Aladdin told him that he had sold twelve such for a piece of gold each, "'What a villain!' cried the goldsmith. "'But,' added he, "'my son, what is past cannot be recalled.' by showing you the value of the plate which is of the finest silver we use in our shops i will let you see how much the jew has cheated you the goldsmith took a pair of scales weighed the dish and assured him that the plate would fetch by weight sixty pieces of gold which he offered to pay down immediately aladdin thanked him for his fair dealing and never after went to any other person Though Aladdin and his mother had an inexhaustible treasure in their lamp, and might have had whatever they wished for, yet they lived with the same frugality as before, and it may easily be supposed that the money for which Aladdin had sold the dishes and tray was sufficient to maintain them some time. During this interval Aladdin frequented the shops of the principal merchants, where they sold cloth of gold and silver, linens, silk stuffs, and jewelry, and oft-times joining in their conversation, acquired a knowledge of the world and a desire to improve himself. By his acquaintance among the jewellers, he came to know that the fruits which he had gathered when he took the lamp were, instead of coloured glass, stones of inestimable value. But he had the prudence not to mention this to any one, not even to his mother. One day, as Aladdin was walking about the town, he heard an order proclaimed, commanding the people to shut up their shops and houses, and keep within doors, while the Princess Budir al Budur, the Sultan's daughter, went to the bath and returned. This proclamation inspired Aladdin with eager desire to see the Princess's face, which he determined to gratify by placing himself behind the door of the bath so that he could not fail to see her face. Aladdin had not long concealed himself before the princess came. She was attended by a great crowd of ladies, slaves, and mutes, who walked on each side and behind her. When she came within three or four paces of the door of the bath, she took off her veil, and gave Aladdin an opportunity of a full view of her face. The princess was a noted beauty. Her eyes were large, lively, and sparkling, her smile bewitching, her nose faultless, her mouth small, her lips vermilion. It is not therefore surprising that Aladdin, who had never before seen such a blaze of charms, was dazzled and enchanted. After the princess had passed by and entered the bath, Aladdin quitted his hiding-place and went home. His mother perceived him to be more thoughtful and melancholy than usual, and asked what had happened to make him so, or, or if he was ill. He then told his mother all his adventure, and concluded by declaring, "'I love the princess more than I can express, and am resolved that I will ask her in marriage of the sultan.' Aladdin's mother listened with surprise to what her son told her, but when he talked of asking the princess in marriage, she laughed aloud. "'Alas, child,' said she, "'what are you thinking of? You must be mad to talk thus.' "'I assure you, mother,' replied aladdin that i am not mad but in my right senses i foresaw that you would reproach me with folly and extravagance but i must tell you once more that i am resolved to demand the princess of the sultan and marriage nor do i despair of success i have the slaves of the lamp and of the ring to help me and you know how powerful their aid is and i have another secret to tell you those pieces of glass, which I got from the trees in the garden of this subterranean palace, are jewels of inestimable value, and fit, fit for the greatest monarchs. 
all the precious stones the jewellers have in Baghdad are not to be compared to mine for size or beauty, and I am sure that the offer of them will secure the favour of the Sultan. You have a large porcelain dish fit to hold them. Fetch it, and let us see how they will look when we have arranged them according to their different colours. Aladdin's mother brought the china dish, when he took the jewels out of the two purses in which he had kept them, and placed them in order according to his fancy. But the brightness and luster they emitted in the daytime, and the variety of the colours so dazzled the eyes both of mother and son, that they were astonished beyond measure. Aladdin's mother, emboldened by the sight of these rich jewels, and fearful lest her son should be guilty of greater extravagance, complied with his request, and promised to go early the next morning to the palace of the Sultan. Aladdin rose before daybreak, awakened his mother, pressing her to go to the Sultan's palace, and to get admittance, if possible, before the Grand Vizier, the other viziers, and the great officers of state went in to take their seats in the divan where the sultan always attended in person. Aladdin's mother took the china dish in which they had put the jewels the day before, wrapped it in two fine napkins, and set forward for the sultan's palace. When she came to the gates, the grand vizier, the other viziers, and most distinguished lords of the court were just gone in. But notwithstanding the crowd of people was great, she got into the divan, a spacious hall the entrance into which was very magnificent. She placed herself just before the Sultan, Grand Vizier, and the great lords, who sat in council on his right and left hand. Several causes were called, according to their order, pleaded and adjudged, until the time the divan generally broke up, when the Sultan, rising, returned to his apartment, attended by the Grand Vizier. The other viziers and minister of the state then retired, as also did all those whose business had called them thither. Aladdin's mother, seeing the Sultan retire and all the people depart, judged lightly that he would not sit again that day, and resolved to go home, and on her arrival said with much simplicity, "'Son, I have seen the Sultan, and am very well persuaded he has seen me too, for I placed myself just before him. But he was so much taken up with those who attended on all sides of him that I pitied him, and wondered at his patience.' At last, I believe, he was heartily tired, for he rose up suddenly, and would not hear a great many who were ready prepared to speak to him, but went away, at which I was well pleased, for indeed I began to lose all patience, and was extremely fatigued with staying so long. But there is no harm done. I will go again to-morrow. Perhaps the Sultan may not be so busy. The next morning she repaired to the Sultan's palace with the present, as early as the day before but she found the gates of the divan shut. She went six times afterwards, on the days appointed, placed herself always directly before the sultan, but with as little success as the first morning. On the sixth day, however, after the divan was broken up, when the sultan returned to his own apartment, he said to his grand vizier, I have for some time observed a certain woman who attends constantly every day that I give audience, with something wrapped up in a napkin. She always stands up from the beginning to the breaking up of the audience, and affects to place herself just before me. If this woman comes to our next audience, do not fail to call her, that I might hear what she has to say. The Grand Vizier made answer by lowering his hand, and then lifting it up above his head signifying his willingness to lose it if he failed. On the next audience day, when Aladdin's mother went to the divan, and placed herself in front of the sultan as usual, the grand vizier immediately called the chief of the mace-bearers, and pointed to her, bade him bring her before the sultan. The old woman at once followed the mace-bearer, and when she reached the sultan, bowed her head down to the carpet which covered the platform of the throne, and remained in that posture until he bade her to rise, which she had no sooner done than he said to her, "'Good women, I have observed you to stand many days from the beginning to the rising of the divan. What business brings you here?' After these words Aladdin's mother prostrated herself a second time, and when she arose said, "'Monarch of monarchs, 
I beg of you to pardon the boldness of my petition, and to assure me of your pardon and forgiveness. Well, replied the Sultan, I will forgive you, be it what it may, and no hurt shall come to you. Speak boldly. When Aladdin's mother had taken all these precautions, for fear of the Sultan's anger, she told him faithfully the errand on which her son had sent her, and the event which led to his making so bold a request in spite of all her remonstrances. The Sultan hearkened to this discourse without showing the least anger, but before he gave her any answer asked her what she had brought tied up in the napkin. She took the china dish which she had set down at the foot of the throne, untied it, and presented it to the Sultan. The Sultan's amazement and surprise were inexpressible when he saw so many large, beautiful, and valuable jewels collected in the dish. He remained for some time lost in admiration. At last, when he recovered himself, he received the present from Aladdin's mother's hand, saying, "'How rich! How beautiful!' After he had admired and handled all the jewels, one after another, he turned to his grand vizier, and showing the dish, said, "'Behold, admire, wonder, and confess that your eyes never beheld jewels so rich and beautiful before.' The vizier was charmed. "'Well,' continued the sultan, "'what sayest thou to such a present? Is it not worthy of the princess, my daughter?' and ought I not to bestow her on one who values her at so great a price? I cannot but own, replied the Grand Vizier, that the present is worthy of the princess, but I beg of your majesty to grant me three months before you come to a final resolution. I hope, before that time, my son, whom you have regarded with your favour, will be able to make a nobler present than this Aladdin, who is an entire stranger to your majesty. The Sultan granted his request, and he said to the old woman, "'Good women, go home, and tell your son that I agree to the proposal you have made me. But I cannot marry the princess, my daughter, for three months. At the expiration of that time, come again.' Aladdin's mother returned home, much more gratified than she had expected, and told her son with much joy the condescending answer she had received from the Sultan's own mouth and that she was to come to the divan again that day three months. Aladdin thought himself the most happy of all men at hearing this news, and thanked his mother for the pains she had taken in the affair, the good success of which was so great importance to his peace that he counted every day, week, and even hour as it passed. When two of the three months were passed, his mother, one evening, having no oil in the house, went out to buy some, and found a general rejoicing. The houses, dressed with foliage, silks, and carpeting, and every one striving to show their joy according to their ability. The streets were covered with officers in habits of ceremony, mounted on horses, richly caparisoned, each attended by a great many footmen. Aladdin's mother asked the oil merchant what was the meaning of all this preparation of public festivity. "'Whence came you, good woman,' said he, "'that you don't know that the Grand Vizier's son is to marry the Princess Budir al Budur, the Sultan's daughter, to-night. She will presently return from the bath, and these officers whom you see are to assist at the cavalcade to the palace where the ceremony is to be solemnized.' Aladdin's mother, on hearing these news, ran home very quickly. "'Child!' cried she. "'You are undone. The Sultan's fine promises will come to naught. This night the Grand Vizier's son is to marry the Princess Budir al Budur. At this account Aladdin was thunderstruck, and he bethought himself of the lamp and of the genie who promised to obey him, and without indulging in idle words against the Sultan, the Vizier, or his son, he determined, if possible, to prevent the marriage. When Aladdin had got into his chamber, he took the lamp, rubbed it in the same place as before, when immediately the genie appeared, and said to him, "'What wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave, I and the other slaves of the lamp.' "'Hear me,' said Aladdin, Thou hast hitherto obeyed me, but now I am about to impose on thee a harder task. The sultan's daughter 
who was promised me as my bride, is this night married to the son of the Grand Vizier. Bring them both hither to me immediately they have retired to their bedchamber. Master, replied the genie, I obey you. Aladdin supped with his mother as was their wont, and then went to his own apartment and sat up to await the return of the genie according to his commands. In the meantime, the festivities in honor of the princess's marriage were conducted in the sultan's palace with great magnificence. The ceremonies were at last brought to a conclusion, and the princess and the son of the vizier retired to the bedchamber prepared for them. No sooner had they entered it, and dismissed their attendants, than the genie, the faithful slave of the lamp, to the great amazement and alarm of the bride and bridegroom, took up the bed, and by an agency invisible to them transported it in an instant into Aladdin's chamber, where he set it down. "'Remove the bridegroom,' said Aladdin to the genie, "'and keep him a prisoner till to-morrow dawn, and then return with him here.' On Aladdin being left alone with the princess, he endeavored to assuage her fears and explain to her the treachery practiced upon him by the sultan, her father. He then laid himself down beside her, putting a drawn scimitar between them to show that he was determined to secure her safety and to treat her with the utmost possible respect. At break of day the genie appeared at the appointed hour, bringing back the bridegroom, whom, by breathing upon, he had left motionless and entranced at the door of Aladdin's chamber during the night, and, at Aladdin's command, transported the couch with the bride and bridegroom in it, by the same invisible agency, into the palace of the sultan. At the instant that the genie had set down the couch with the bride and bridegroom in their own chamber, the sultan came to the door to offer his good wishes to his daughter. The grand vizier's son, who was almost perished with cold, by standing in his thin undergarment all night, no sooner heard the knocking at the door than he got out of bed and ran into the robing chamber, where he had undressed himself the night before. The sultan, having opened the door, went to the bedside, kissed the princess on the forehead, but was extremely surprised to see her look so melancholy. She only cast at him a sorrowful look expressive of great affliction. He suspected there was something extraordinary in this silence and thereupon went immediately to the sultaness's apartment, told her what a state he found the princess, and how she had received him. "'Sire,' said the sultaness, "'I will go and see her. She will not receive me in the same manner.' The princess received her mother with sighs and tears and signs of deep dejection. At last, upon her pressing on her the duty of telling her all her thoughts, she gave to the sultaness a precise description of all that had happened to her during the night, on which the sultaness enjoined on her the necessity of silence and discretion, as no one would give credence to so strange a tale. The grand vizier's son, elated with the honor of being the sultan's son-in-law, kept silence on his part, and the events of the night were not allowed to cast the least gloom on the festivities on the following day, in continued celebration of the royal marriage. When night came, the bride and bridegroom were again attended to their chamber with the same ceremonies as on the preceding evening. Aladdin, knowing that this would be so, had already given his commands to the genie of the lamp. And no sooner were they alone than their bed was removed in the same mysterious manner as on the preceding evening. And having passed the night in the same unpleasant way, they were in the morning conveyed to the palace of the sultan. Scarcely had they been replaced in their apartment when the sultan came to make his compliments to his daughter, when the princess could no longer conceal from him the unhappy treatment she had been subject to, and told him all that had happened as she had already related it to her mother. The sultan, on hearing these strange tidings, consulted with the grand vizier, and finding from him that his son had been subjected to even worse treatment by the invisible agency, he determined to declare the marriage to be cancelled, and all the festivities, which were yet to last for several days, to be countermanded and terminated. This sudden change in the mind of the Sultan gave rise to various speculations and reports. Nobody but Aladdin knew the secret, and he kept it with the most scrupulous silence, and neither the Sultan nor the Grand Vizier, 
who had forgotten Aladdin and his request, had the least thought that he had any hand in the strange adventures that befell the bride and bridegroom. On the very day that the three months contained in the Sultan's promise expired, the mother of Aladdin again went to the palace, and stood in the same place in the divan. The Sultan knew her again, and directed his vizier to have her brought before him. After having prostrated herself, she made answer in reply to the Sultan, "'Sire, I came at the end of three months to ask of you the fulfillment of the promise you made to my son.' The Sultan little thought the request of Aladdin's mother was made to him in earnest, or that he would hear any more of the matter. He therefore took counsel with his vizier, who suggested that the Sultan should attach such conditions to the marriage that no one of the humble condition of Aladdin could possibly fulfill. In accordance with this suggestion of the vizier, the Sultan replied to the mother of Aladdin, "'Good women, it is true Sultans ought to abide by their word, and I am ready to keep mine, by making your son happy in marriage with the princess, my daughter. But as I cannot marry her without some further proof of your son being able to support her in royal state, you may tell him— I will fulfil my promise as soon as he shall send for me forty trays of massy gold, full of the same sort of jewels you have already made me a present of, and carried by the like number of black slaves, who shall be led by as many young and handsome white slaves, all dressed magnificently. On these conditions I am ready to bestow the princess my daughter upon him. Therefore, good women, go and tell him so, and I will wait till you bring me his answer. 